Hey everybody, Chad Westport here, and we're back with another episode in the special series with Dr. Mayabi Shields. We are covering the endocannabinoid systems, cannabinoids, their reactions, and this time we are going to be talking about what research is taking place and what results are being hypothesized. As you might have heard in the previous episodes, it's not necessarily new, but on the big scale, it is new and emerging science. Plenty to learn. So I will turn it over to the doctor here. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. And this question is just massive because there has been <laughs> such a huge increase in research in a great way um, in both cannabis and the psychedelics front. There's been just mm -hmm. like a, re a renaissance. Um, and a lot of that has to be attributed to um, Charlotte Figgy and her mother and the 2018 Farm Bill and decriminalizing or not decriminalizing, but federally legalizing hemp and allowing hemp to be researched. And then also a lot of it has to be attributed to the movements that have been going on around medical cannabis for decades and decades, because we have literally only been researching the negatives about it for a very, very long time. Um, and there's a lot of really exciting research out there. I mean, it's, it depends on what niche you're interested in. I think like where you want to go down in terms of like how cannabis can help at the community level with like our chronic pain and people who are suffering from GI issues, let alone like it's anti-tumorgenic effects for cancer. Like there's a bunch of research being done on CBD and anxiety and mental health. And there's also, I mean, and also, um, some of the rare cannabinoids are starting to get more attention and have information on like sleep disorders. Um, my personal interests are like kind of super niche. And I think it's fascinating that the endocannabinoid system interacts with other systems directly. So we mentioned earlier, the CB1 receptor is the main receptor that will interact with THC <laughs> that causes you to feel high or like altered. Um, and I think it's super interesting. But the CB1 receptor can actually bind to other receptors like the serotonin receptor, like the dopamine receptor. It's called heterodimerization, and it's like a transformer effect. They come together, and they're like, Poo, by the powers combined, and yes. they signal together. And I think that that is something that's super fascinating. It's been shown that like those of us who you know are regulars we'll have different levels of these dimers in Ooh. our brains. Like we have different levels of serotonin specifically 2A, which I also find interesting because the serotonin 2A receptor is the one that's responsible for psychedelic experiences for wow. the most part. It's the one that's like more linked um, to that. And I, I find that part fascinating. I think that like exploring into what I was calling the endocannabinoid dome. There's a lot of more new research on like kind of like lower level interactions or not lower level, but um, <laughs> almost like the entourage effect within our bodies of all of these other smaller endocannabinoids and how they interact with them. And like an example I could give is that like my enzyme that I worked on, um, which was a little machine that chewed up the endocannabinoids and deactivated them. Um, it worked on the endocannabinoid 2-AG. That was like its main, that's why it's called an endocannabinoid enzyme, but it was very promiscuous. I mean, it was chewing up a lot of, a lot of <laughs> other fats and stuff. And um, I just think that that is understanding sort of like that promiscuity at both the enzyme level, how they're acting and then the receptor levels. And then also at the level of the phytocannabinoids, like an example for that is CBD. Like CBD has been, um, posited to have like 65 targets in the body plus i'm mm. i wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't more um it's just very very flexible and we're still finding like new interactions or combinations of these cannabinoids and how they can have different effects when they're used together and when they're used for specific people um i'm also really interested in all the research coming out with cannabis or the endocannabinoid system and autism spectrum and there's a good amount of evidence linking clinical endocannabinoid deficiency to it. And actually, I've never, I didn't define this in the previous ones, but um, I think I mentioned that, maybe not, but that endocannabinoid system is linked to chronic pain, mental health, and GI issues. Uh, I call it the triad of suffering, and it sucks, mm. and I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, it's 
really common for someone to have more than one of those things. And it's pretty common if you have more than one to have the third as right. well, because they kind of all play <clears throat> off one another and they all flare within one another. And there's a theory by Dr. Ethan Russo called clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, which also it is a theory. Clinical endocannabinoid deficiency is a theory, um, but a lot of science things are still theories, even though we have right. a lot of proof for them. Um, and I think that there's a lot of evidence that some people have lower levels of endocannabinoids. And so these phytocannabinoids are bal a balancing effect, right? Because I, I believe I have clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. It would be hard to tell now since I use cannabis so regularly and it alters those levels as well. Um, but if you have lowered levels of endocannabinoids, it's associated with chronic pain, GI issues, and like neurologic issues like migraines uh, are associated with it, as well as PTSD, fibromyalgia, um, and IBS or irritable yep. bowel syndrome. <clears throat> and I'm pretty interested in a lot of the emerging um, information on that, on specifically clinical endocannabinoid deficiency and how cannabis can be helpful for people with clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. There's been, um, this isn't super recent, but there's been a good amount of research on PTSD and night terrors mm -hmm. and that THC specifically will impair your, your night terrors. I mean, yes, right. it, when people ask me if I'm concerned about my REM sleep because THC interferes with your REM sleep, I tell them no, because I have night terrors. So if I have right. REM sleep, then I'm having night terrors and yeah. I am waking up and, you know, vivid and sometimes violent. Like they're, are they dreams? Like, yeah, they feel like reality. And mm -hmm. that experience, um, it goes away when using when using THC for a lot of people who have PTSD. And this isn't like super new research, but I think it's really interesting because I think it's linked to, you know, the CB1 receptor levels and being able to change that with your cannabis intake. And so there's, I mean, there's so much just really, really cool research out there. Like I sometimes I just go on just like if I have an hour and look mm -hmm. at it and just see it because it's a lot. I mean, it is like every day something new and the mainstream media will never, you know, will never cover it. They're never, not never. I mean, I hope they do someday, you know, it's really hard. If you see the amount of positive research that's out there, I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty large and substantial. Um, and yet all the big headlines that make it out there are the negative, mm -hmm. are the negative research uh, headlines. And a piece of that is propaganda, a piece of that is federal legalization and like, control of the media that's a yeah. whole other topic but like it's like you know the amount of research is coming out with the promise of what cannabinoids what rare cannabinoids like how, how they can help with humanity i mean it's it's yeah. huge so I'm, I'm excited about it as am i and i am so glad that you broke it down in that way too because it uh, it paints a pretty good picture of where we still have to go what we can discover and what we think we already know we will discover because yeah like like we were talking earlier um science likes to wait until it's really obvious that there's a benefit to something it's, it's never certain though like that's the point of science is that like the whole point of science is that we never know what we're going to discover next and that it's quite possible that everything that we think is wrong everyone mm -hmm. thought the earth was flat until it's not and then some people still do i mean we won't talk about that but like but like you know that's kind of the whole point of science is that it's always evolving um but yeah i mean in terms of like being really really sure that medical system, that's a perspective that's been put into our minds, very specifically devaluing other types of medicine, you know, mm -hmm. that are maybe happen to be not of colonial, like, ba background. Um, and it's a type of scientific elitism that does, it quite frankly, exists in a very, very real way. In, and it has real effects on our health and wellness. So um it's there the good research is out there but it's definitely not um not to be like oh it's not proven and it's not it's it's all early yeah. people <laughs> like to say that and and i think it's like yeah kind of but it's also like kind of proven in the community too so there's you know <laughs> Yeah, that there's there's decades of anecdotal evidence that is now finally being allowed to 
be investigated in a proper manner. So we will see some some things coming up. But is there one particular or maybe a couple resources for people to search, or are there a couple good keywords people can type into Google to find, you know, these reportings or where to go to find a compiled list of some of these? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most valuable things to learn how to do is to go on to PubMed. So it's all one word, PubMed. I think it's .gov. Because uh, this is kind of like one of the larger repositories. I, another one would be Google Scholar, which is scholar.google.com. Um, they're one of the bigger repositories. I like PubMed because you can search, and same with Google Scholar, but you can search by like free and, and other things, keywords. But right. I would go down rabbit holes with that. And I would encourage people to start trying to read just the abstract. Um, and if you're having a hard time with the abstract, so if you're not familiar, the abstract of a scientific paper is like a little summary and it will always be free. So if you go to pubmed.gov and you just type in cannabis, it'll just it'll pull down like it'll give you all of them that that kind of like fit under cannabis let's say you find one that you want to read you click on it it'll give you the abstract right there the abstract is just one paragraph and they almost always follow the same exact format the first couple sentences are telling you what the problem is that they're investigating then the middle chunk is telling you what they did and what they found and then the very end is telling you what their conclusions were from the study and one of the most valuable skills I think people can have is learning to read scientific literature if it is just reading the abstract. Because um, we've done we've done some content together where we're talking about scientific articles. I mean, it gets dense. It gets <laughs> it gets inaccessible. It gets really difficult to read. But for the most part, a lot of scientific abstracts are accessible. The first mm -hmm. couple of sentences and the last couple of sentences are the most important things. Um, to be able to read and understand. And yes, like in the perfect world, you would understand the whole thing and be able to read the whole paper, but that's that's not reality. That's incredibly inaccessible for, yeah. for, for most people. Um, and I think that I think that that's a really great place to start to be able to look through. And like, I've been curating some free resources on my website. Um, I hope to be doing like paper reviews on, on them too, where I kind of break nice. them down and make them easier. But sure. um, we'll, have, we'll have to do another video series where you do like- a But yes, that's, that will be fun. And everybody watching here too, again, don't forget to go to her website and her other links, which are down in the description. Learn a lot more. Uh, we're only scratching the surface here. Uh, coming back to of all the things that we could talk about, everybody let me know, please, down in the comments comments what you would like to hear Dr. Mayabi Shields talk about and discuss because we've been having fun with this series so far, but we want to now kind of maybe turn it over to you. So please tell us what you want to know. Tell us what you want to hear. Go check out her website as well. Look for some answers, but if not, we'll bring them back right here to do it again. So I guess maybe just closing this one out. Uh, anything else you want to say about the future i think it looks good awesome <laughs> i know what a At poorly framed so. question <laughs> look into your crystal ball no all right well hope everybody's had fun uh again this is not the last one so keep coming back for this special series and we appreciate you watching so until next time peace out everybody one, two, one, four.